Over the past few months, Intel have had a lot of pressure on them thanks to the Ryzen range of processors from AMD. And Team Red are continuing the onslaught with Threadripper, threatening to take a slice out of Intel's HEDT Pi. Well, that doesn't mean that Intel are just going to sit back on its laurels and let AMD do that, and so have of course released the X299 platform, thanks to the Skylake X range of processors. My name's Paul, and in this Game Theatrecom video, we're going to be reviewing MSR's X299 Gaming M7 ACK, along with the Intel i9-7900X processor. Now, as full disclosure, we were sent these samples for review purposes, but they have since gone back to MSI, and this is not a sponsored video, in other words, no money has changed hand, and all opinions, of course, are our own. There has been a lot of criticism prior to release of the X299 platform for Intel's decision to release the i7-7640K and the 7740K processors. Both CPUs, of course, are quad-core with the 7740K featuring hyper-threading as well, so that is 8 threads total. But it's 2017, and I feel that the message of a quad-core processor on a HDDT platform nowadays is just... just weird. It not only makes things confusing for the customers, but I don't see any real scenario where this is going to be beneficial. So with that in mind, we're going to be focusing squarely on the Skylake X range of processors in this particular review, specifically the i9-7900X. So before we jump into the review itself, I feel it's prudent for us to understand what's changed with Skylake X over its older Broadwell E cousin. This isn't just a simple case of the Skylake form, the mainstream line, being adapted with more cores for the X299 platform. Indeed, there are some inherent differences, and certainly quite a few differences over its older Broadwell E cousin. So let's just jump into it. Perhaps the standout change between X99 and X299 is the catching system where we see a much larger level 2 cache per core, 256 kilobytes has been upped to 1 megabyte, and a proportionally smaller level 3 cache. The theory behind this is that because level 3 cache is slower, Intel wanted to reduce the chance that the CPU would dump needed data into this victim cache. Thus, in theory anyway, we have higher IPC and lower latency cache can be achieved. We also see the introduction of our AVX512 with Scarlet X, a welcome feature over Broadwell E. AVX, Advanced Vector Extensions, are a set of instructions allowing single instruction multi-data, and given the 512-bit nature of Intel support, in theory at least, it's much faster than Ryzen's architecture, which is 256-bit AVX per cycle. It'll be interesting how AVX 512 will prove beneficial for Intel's X299 adventure, particularly over the next, say, 12 months up against AMD's Ryzen Threadripper. And currently, 512-bit instructions will largely be aimed at enterprise-level software, but, apparently anyway, Intel are helping developers tweak code to take advantage of it for more mainstream applications. We also see further support for SpeedShift, which asks the host OS to let the CPU itself handle frequency control over much of its P states. What does this allow the CPU to do? Well, it allows the CPU to adjust its frequency much faster and more accurately than what the operating system could ever hope to do. In testing, this allows the CPU to ramp up from a low power, lower clock state, such as idle, to max clocks in a much shorter amount of time. Intel claims that these, we can see these tasks being finished in just 35 milliseconds compared to 100 of the legacy implementation. The other big discussion point with X299 is the distribution of PCIe lanes. And you'll need a 7900X or above to get 44 PCIe lanes, while the 7820X offers just 28. For those wishing to add a lot of devices such as M2 drives, graphics cards and other bits and bobs, the absence of additional I.O. bandwidth hurts. This is not the fault of the motherboard, rather it's the inherent decision of Intel Skylink X architecture. It's a real shame as if you don't need the additional processor cores, but you need the additional lanes, you're still going to have to be forced to go up the CPU stack. Now we've gone over the basics of the X299 platform and Skylark X, let's focus squarely on MSI's entry into this particular market. The motherboard's design is pleasing, with dark greys and gunmetal blacks, complete with just touches of silver across certain details of the board, for example, the heat sinks and, of course, the steel armour which MSI uses on both PCIe slots, along with the memory slots as well. For power connectors, you're looking at the usual 24-pin board power, plus an 8- and a 4-pin uh, CPU power connector. 
We tested our board without the additional 4-pin power connector but experienced no problems. There were a few reports online that in this configuration, the 8-pin CPU cable can get rather hot. And while I can't speak for other setups, all I can say is on our rig, when running CPU intensive tasks, nothing fell out of the ordinary. There have also been some concerns with VRM and power distribution temperatures. And unfortunately, due to time constraints, we couldn't really test these extensively with our board. However, using MSI's own command center, we got a reported MOSFET temps of around 70-ish degrees. And this is on an open bench, but with no fans. Aiming a desk fan at a low setting and quite a distance away, which helps to simulate uh, air moving inside a case, pushed the temps down by about 5-ish degrees. This was on multiple runs of Frybench running on the 7900X CPU. Getting back to I.O., as you'd expect of an X299 board, it of course supports quad-channel memory, meaning 8 DIMM slots with a maximum capacity total of 128GB of RAM, running up to 4133MHz+. plus. There are 4 PCIe 3.016 slots and 2 PCIe EX1 slots, providing ample room for multi-graphics card configurations, 8 SATA ports, 1 U2 port, 2 M2 slots, which are located under liftable heat sinks under the MSI's Dragon logo. One of the M2 slots is an 8CM type, whereas Little Brother is a 10CM type. Both support PCIe times 4 and times 2 Gen 3, but it is important to know that M2, U2 and SATA ports share the same bandwidth, so... If you are filling up your system with a lot of SATA connectors, well, your M2 port speed could suffer. There's no shortage of fan headers, and with four four-pin system fan connectors, along with a CPU and water pump connectors, oh, and an RGB LED connector too, most people should be satisfied. For rear I.O., there's everything you would expect from a HEDT system in the modern era, including a plethora of USB ports, the new fangled USB 3.1C is inclusive of that. Two Wi-Fi aerial connectors, which really do improve the signal quality if you are needing to use Wi-Fi. Five times OFC audio jacks and an optical jack as well. Rather handily, you also see a clear CMOS button and a BIOS flashback button, which is handy if you overclock or just something goes awry, but you don't fancy opening up your case, because let's face it, it's not exactly easy to do in some instances. Speaking of rather handy, there's also three buttons located on the board itself. The first is the power button, which essentially acts as if you press the front power of the case. The second is reset, which basically does what it says on the tin, and these are handy for enthusiasts who are testing the board outside the confines of a classic test rig, or for fault testing purposes. And then, well then there's the overclock knob, which increases the maximum frequency of a processor the more you crank it. Different processors set different speeds for different levels. For example, level 1 on the 7900X will push you to 4.4 GHz, but the lowly 7800X will run at 4.1. In the motherboard's BIOS, you're able to switch between controlling this overclocking feature between the hardware, in other words, this knob, or through software, which is handy if you don't want to keep opening up your computer. Personally, I would have preferred this dial to be located on the rear of the board, which would have made things a lot easier rather than needing to rely on opening up the case, particularly if you've rooted cables in this area. I'll grant you, quite often you've probably set it and forget it with overclocks, but still, it would be kind of handy to have it on the rear, at least in my opinion. A good BIOS is imperative, and it's very easy to forget how unintuitive and clunky BIOSes from just five or six years ago were compared to today's slick beasts. Like a few other manufacturers, we feel that MSI have gotten pretty damn good handle on their BIOSes, and the first thing we did is update the board to the latest available BIOS. The initial screen of the BIOS gives you the basic overview of system configuration, and at the top left you are able to uh, turn on XMP memory configurations rather handily, and also the game boost mode. This is how you can either use the overclocking knob located on the motherboard, or choose to let things be handled via software. You can, of course, change boot order, save multiple configurations of BIOSes, and so on. MSI have also provided you the ability to explore what's plugged into the board, handy for fault testing, and finally monitor temps, fan speeds, and all of that jazz, rather than need to go into Windows. 
Under advanced configuration, well, really it's an overclockers and tweakers dream, allowing you to adjust pretty much anything from CPU ratios, turbo frequencies, AVX, AVX offsets, ring ratios, memory timings, and plethora of processor voltages. We didn't have any issues with the BIOS stability, but in this day and age, it's not too surprising. As you would also expect of a modern motherboard, MSI provides you the function to flash the BIOS using USB when you're sat inside of it. The procedure is about what you'd expect. Download the BIOS from the internet, stick it on a thumbstick, and choose the relevant file while you're sat on the BIOS screen. For this video, we're going to be focusing primarily on the i9-7900X. Although we did have the 7820X along with it, we feel that the 7900 is the CPU that most people want to opt for for a board of this caliber. Not just because of the additional PCIe lanes, but also the additional cores and threads. So what about the basic specifications of the 7900X? Well, it of course has 10 cores, 20 threads, thanks to hyperthreading, with a base clock of 3.3 GHz. Now it does turbo up to 4.3 GHz, and in some rare instances, if a workload is just pushing uh, across a couple of cores, it will go up to about 4.4 to 4.5 GHz. As we discussed earlier, cache has also seen a redistribution, with just 13.75 MB of level 3, which is roughly half that of the 25 found in the Broadwell E 10-core entry, the i7-6950X. For those just caching, I'm sorry, up, I, I couldn't resist, I'm sorry. This is due to Intel redistributing die space to increasing the level 2 cache by 4 times the amount of old, from 256 kilobytes to 1 megabyte. So, this means a grand total of 10 megabytes level 2 cache for the entire chip. Pretty damn impressive. This cache is non-inclusive rather than inclusive too. In a nutshell, it means that the data will not be mirrored in another cache, so quite ex quite simply it's exclusively held in that particular cache. There have been a few reports that this processor gets quite toasty, and we decided to test our system with a fairly basic AIO. A Corsair H75 and the CPU quickly hit mid-70s, but without too many problems, including no instability or downclocking when it was under load. The only thing we did notice is pretty obviously it got kind of warm. Unfortunately, we didn't have a large amount of time to test around with different AIOs, but from our testing, we would recommend a high-end unit if you're planning on overclocking the device and with good airflow, which should pretty much speak for itself if you're getting a CPU of this caliber anyway. For overclocking, we decided to test out MSI's own overclocking functionality and decided to push up to 4.6 gigahertz and did so without any problems other than temps starting to creep past what, quite frankly, we were comfortable with when we started to hit the mid 80s and high 80s. We do suspect we could have pushed higher, particularly with a better cooler and with more manual tweaking, but unfortunately time limits crept in. Benchmarking this processor is certainly a treat and is easily the fastest CPU that we've ever tested, especially for the desktop. There's a certain pleasure that you get for seeing 20 threads attack Cinebench R15, and honestly I'd be amazed if you didn't have a bit of a smile on your face the first time you see it. Comparing a processor against AMD's Ryzen 7 lineup or even Intel's own KB-Link, it's obvious that neither processor lineup can compare. To put this in any level of perspective, the multi-core score of the 7900X reached a staggering 2350 points in Cinebench R15, decimating any other processor in the running. It's a rather fascinating set of results, as Skylake X CPUs have virtually all the single thread crunching power of the mainstream i7 lineups, for example Kabelink, thus giving them an advantage over Ryzen applications which push single thread performance, but also feature sheer number of cores, Intel managed to brute force their way past virtually any other offerings. If you're purely a gamer, it's obvious that the number of cores are strictly overkill, even if you're a video streamer who needs a lot of extra horsepower to, for encoding while gaming. The X299 platform is just difficult to recommend purely because of the cost. If you do encoding for home video with say Adobe Premiere, then there may be additional reason to push for the X299, but honestly this platform is designed for those who need a lot of processor horsepower. The biggest issue with i9-7900X is the pricing and release timing. Yes, the CPU is hot and is power hungry, but I suspect the target demographic for HEDT won't mind plonking down a few extra bucks on a better PSU, and the price difference between it and the Ryzen 7 or AMD's Threadripper could be a concern though. If single thread performance is as important to you as multi-thread, 
or you want to use applications which possibly push AVX instructions or the other usual Intel benefits, including Optane, then really and truly the 7900X is an excellent buy. Comparing this processor to AMD's Ryzen 7 lineup or even Intel's own Kaby Lake or Skylake lineup of the mainstream market, and there's just no competition. Not only does it have incredibly impressive single thread performance, but also in terms of multi-thread, it just decimates the competition. With Cinebench R15, we managed to hit 2350 points, which is nothing short of mind blowing if you're coming from a four core eight thread system. If you're purely a gamer, it's obvious that the number of cores are strictly overkill. Even if you're a video streamer who needs a lot of extra horsepower to, for encoding while gaming, the X299 platform is just difficult to recommend purely because of the cost. If you do encoding for home video with say Adobe Premiere, then there may be additional reason to push for the X299. But honestly, this platform is designed for those who need a lot of processor horsepower. The biggest issue with i9-7900X is the pricing and release timing. Yes, the CPU is hot and is power hungry, but I suspect the target demographic for HEDT won't mind plonking down a few extra bucks on a better PSU. And the price difference between it and the Ryzen 7 or AMD's Threadripper could be a concern though. If single thread performance is as important to you as multi-thread, or you want to use applications which possibly push AVX instructions or the other usual Intel benefits, including Optane, then really and truly the 7900X is an excellent buy. I love this motherboard, I really do. I admit that looks are subjective as hell, but in my opinion at least, I feel that MSI really nailed the aesthetics of this board. I know that LEDs can become some kind of a dirty term in computers nowadays, especially among enthusiasts, but I do feel that MSI have really nailed the subtleties of LEDs. Now, of course, you can configure their color along with, you know, the whole design of your case, but what's nice about this, of course, is you can, yes, turn off the LEDs, but also they don't feel like they're, well, destroying the aesthetics of the board. They feel that they're complementary rather than just taking over. Like the i9-7900X, the major downfall of this board, like almost anything in the HEDT market, remains pricing. At around $400 US dollars, or about 350 Great British Pounds, for the motherboard, it's a very steep investment. Storage and connectivity-wise, the Wi-Fi signal was perfect, particularly when one connects to antennas. Audio quality was just fantastic, thanks to the 7.1 audio, and for those with an audio setup, who can do it justice? If you have the cash and you want to dive into the X299 platform, this motherboard is just an excellent place to start your research. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the video and found it somewhat informative on your purchase and whether you want to buy this motherboard or processor. With that said, I also want to reiterate what I did uh, point out at the beginning of this very video, and that is that this is not a sponsored video at all. But we were sent the product from MSI to review, but it has since gone back to the company, so I no longer have it in my possession, unfortunately for me. But with all of that said, if you do want more reviews, more news, more technology, that type of thing, then don't hesitate to subscribe on the channel. There is a lot more stuff coming up over the next couple of weeks. So with all of that said, Hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.